Welcome to tonight's panel, uh, Comedy and Writing. Uh, before we get started, though, I want to go around the room and have anyone, everyone, <laughs> introduce themselves <laughs> and, and a little bit about why they're on this panel. And we'll go ahead and start with you, Jody. Hi, I'm Jody Lynn Nye. I write science fiction and fantasy, most of it with a humorous bent. And I presume that's why they snarked me into this. All right, perfect. Rick. My name is Rick Gualtieri. And, you know, some people allegedly think I'm funny. I don't particularly believe them, but, uh, you know, I mostly write uh, horror, comedy, and fantasy. All right, perfect. Uh, Jeff. I'm Jeff Strand. I mostly write horror comedy for adults, and I've also written just straight comedy for young adults and a few non-horror comedies. So pretty much everything I write has a pretty strong element of humor. All right, perfect. Uh, Susan? Hi, my name is Susan Say. I actually write contemporary romance, and the humor just kind of sneaks up on me. Not really sure how it gets in there or why I'm here particularly, but I'm going to do my best to keep up. Of course. Uh, Jean Marie. Hi, my name is Jean Marie Ward. I write fiction, nonfiction, and everything in between. And most of it is comic. And I just got a comic intrusion, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, Nikki. Hi, my name is Nikki Wolfolk. And I was invited here because I am the janitor and I'm just here to pick up things or just wear like pretty much a, a lampshade. <laughs> kidding um so i'm an author i write murder mysteries but they always have a comedic slant um because if you're gonna have a dead body that's kind of depressing but if you have snacks and a whole bunch of laughs that's really awesome so that's what i write all right thank you uh so the first question and i'll start with you rick um what book or books kind of got you into thinking you wanted to write things that were humorous I actually didn't like a lot of uh, a lot of humor books that were out there because I was mostly reading like nonfiction stuff like Dave Barry and I kind of found it about as funny as a train wreck. I, I more come from like, you know, from the world of internet comedy, like, you know, the guys over in like crack.com, like something awful, um, you know, those websites. I spent a lot of time on uh, seanbaby.com and that's kind of, that's the kind of humor I like, the kind of humor, I guess that, uh, that. I won't say it doesn't need an editor, but the kind of, but that an editor probably looks at and says, yeah, my schedule's kind of full. I got things to do. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jeff, what about yourself? Um, it didn't, it's not the book that got me into comedy, but the first time I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams, it was like, he's allowed to do this because I wrote goofy, stupid stuff, but you could never get it published. You could never have any kind of a writing career that way. And then I read that, that, oh my God, you can't. How is he allowed to be that stupid and silly and get paid for it and have it published and in bookstores everywhere? So that, it wasn't what got me into it. I was more magazines like um, Bananas Magazine, stuff aimed at kids that was really silly and stupid. But uh Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was the first actual novel, legitimate novel that made me realize you could do this for a living. All right. Uh, Susan, you said you do romance, but the humor sneaks in. Uh, was there an, a book or oh, books? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Jenny Cruzy's Welcome to Temptation. Oh, I stand yeah. by this. It is the finest romance novel ever written. Um, and here's the thing about humor and romance is that falling in love is the most embarrassing thing you could possibly do. There are so many situations where you are going to find yourself doing something you'd never have predicted. And for my money, that's kind of where the humor comes from. But I will also reveal myself as a child of the eighties and say that, um, do you remember the movie Clue? Super yes! stylish, oh, really <laughs> funny people, like in gorgeous outfits running around being insane. That's absolutely right up my alley. So a lot of snappy patter, a lot of great outfits, a lot of embarrassing situations. I think that's what it does it for me. Perfect. Uh, Jean Marie? I would agree that, you know, for me, it was more about movies and what was happening in the house than what I read. My, uh, I'm Irish Italian. My dad was a big Irishman who was completely beset by my five foot nothing mother. And his way of dealing with that was humor. It was also his way of expressing love. If he was making a joke about you, he loved you, he liked you. He got damn serious if he didn't like you. And that was pretty scary because six foot two, 200 pounds, played semi-pro ball in three sports. Um, and 
the movies that I gravitated to as a, a, a young girl, as uh, adolescent, as a young adult, were things where the, the pattern was snappy, you know, um, uh, His Girl Friday, um, where it's a mile a minute. Um, and the other thing was I was reading a lot of 19th century novels, which were, you'd look at that and go, people don't really act like this. I mean, if you tried this in real life, somebody would bust out laughing because you're being absurd. And so that formed my opinion. Then of course, as I grew older, I realized, oh, we need humor. We need Moliere. We need Shakespeare's comedies because that's the only thing that gets us through the bad times. And that's what I wanted to write, things that got people through the bad times. All right, perfect. Nikki. Um, that's a really good point, Jean Marie. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much why I write what I write. Um, I first write humor and comedy to cheer myself up. Um, there was a time where I was writing, you know, on the side, I was writing a lot of urban fantasy and it was really gritty and it was very visceral. And I was really proud of the work. But by the time I would finish scenes at the end of the day, I would be completely a mess. And it was really, really hard as months would go on and I'd be writing scenes. And I'm like, I'm making myself more depressed and I don't have enough uh, medication to keep you know, doing this. So <laughs> we gotta go a different route. Um, and so things were kind of rough in my world at the time. And I wrote certain scenes and I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna write something fresh and something that'll cheer me up. And I love slapstick. Um, I grew up with watching 1930s and 1940s films. Um, I also love that, that banter. So whether it was in films or if it was in books and even with detective novels, if you, if you read certain scenes, you'll notice like they were you know, kind of joking or they were a bit you know, giving out zingers. And I love that aspect, but you had to pay attention. And so I found myself writing scenes to cheer myself up. And then I thought, well, let me look at that scene because I kind of like that. Let me see what's the worst that could happen and make it funnier. And it got to that point where, especially with one of my books, Maze on Death, it's a steampunk culinary cozy mystery. Um, say that three times fast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with that aspect, there is a scene that was only supposed to be a paragraph long. And it was a very specific plot point because I had to get from point A to point B. So I'm like, okay, ha ha here's this one paragraph. And then I was having a rough, rough time with an odd job um, in my day life. And I wrote this scene again and ended up being two you know, paragraphs. And then I, you know, the next day the job really sucked and I ended up writing like a full page and rewriting it to the point where it was like two and a half pages. Um, long story short, I had three editors looking at it and each one were writing notes like I cried because I was laughing too hard. And it got to the point, cause like there's this whole bordello scene and it's like, it just was so much fun. So for me, when it comes to humor, it's partially to cheer myself up, but then there is that hope that if somebody else is having a rough time, just like I reach back into different books or I reach back into different movies that cheered me up, I'm hoping that my work can do the same, especially on the rough days. So it's kind of like uh, you're wanting instead of writing what you know, you're writing what you want in a sense. Yeah. You're bringing yourself out of it. Yeah, and I think also too, as a, as a black person, I don't really get to see us in humorous situations and I like punching up, <laughs> not down. <laughs> and I don't like the whole after, afternoon school tragedy kind of thing. <laughs> it's like, so, you know, just really wanting to just show a humorous aspect and just that fun part of self, so. All right, perfect. Uh, Jody. Well, like Jean Marie, a lot of the humor comes from my family. We had silly sayings and if something funny happened, it became part of the family legend. Someday I will tell you all the legend of the Easter paper, which is something that is, is ridiculous. My family's Jewish, but my dad <laughs> bought this huge roll of Easter wrapping paper and it became the thing that family gifts were wrapped in for ages. In fact, I still have what's left of it. And there's about an inch left. It's probably 60 feet or so. And just the, the fun of ridiculous things happening. Uh, my, my grandfather, uh, my mom's dad, when he came home from work, he would throw his hat in the door 
and he wouldn't come in yet. He would check to see if my my grandmother threw the hat back out. You know, he would see is is the, if the hat's welcome, I'll follow it. So there there was quite a lot of just humor in the family, and I grew up with with books in the bookshelves like I owe Russia twelve hundred dollars and uh, you're stepping on my cloak and dagger, and you just you just name it alongside the usual books that you would find in the in the houses of the late 50s early 60s uh you would find funny ones and my family just loved things like that the the comedians that were on television the funny shows the funny movies we i reveled in that stuff and i it, it just became part of the framework the marx brothers were my favorites i i am not i'm not a huge fan of, of slapstick so I didn't get, go with the Three Stooges, but my little brother could could tell you every single plot of every single short subject they were ever in. It was just there. It was part of the framework. It's part of my blood. So part of it is, uh, you know, things could be kind of dark around our, our situation. Uh, we were the only Jewish family in an entire neighborhood of Polish Catholics, and that that could be rough at times. But uh, we we had humor. We could we could reflect on it. There's, there's a saying that comedy equals tragedy plus time. So, but also comedy equals tragedy plus distance. So something terrible happening a long way away could, could be very funny. And the longer, it uh, the longer in the past something terrible happened, the more you could make a joke about it. You know, the, the current comedian saying too soon is, is a reflection of that. But yeah, there's, there's, there's so much that is funny I love the old movies too, like many of the people who've, who've already responded to that because they were witty. And I hate current sitcoms. I hate the movies that go for cheap laughs or for humiliation because there's so much good wit that people used to be able to put into shows that there are still a few shows that are, are showing the flag, not enough of them in my opinion, but I appreciate it, I applaud it where I find it. All right, perfect, thank you. Uh, so Jeff, starting with you, let's um, kind of dive into your books and how humor fits into it. You said you write horror, you write pretty much everything of yours is comedy. Yeah, mine wow. varies a lot by each individual book. So if I'm writing a horror novel for adults, a lot of times it's just comic relief and it varies a lot from book to book. So sometimes it's more of a silly premise but a lot of times it's all character based and only stuff that would actually happen in that situation. So like my latest book, Autumn Bleeds Into Winter has a lot of humor because the narrator is 14 years old and he's sort of looking back at the time. He's in his fifties looking back at when he was 14. So there's a lot of humor just from reflections on what a dumb kid he was. But you know, as far as the dialogue goes, there's no witty dialogue when he is confronting the villain because you know I decided you no know, in that situation he's too scared so with that one I went for you know where would the humor naturally occur whereas when I write a young adult novel like my book the greatest zombie movie ever which is about kids making a zombie movie that one the pacing is just joke 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 that is me trying to cram in as many laughs as I possibly can the characters are larger than life the situations are overly goofy that one is just as much humor as I can pack into it, but it really varies. If I'm writing for kids and the books are generally aimed at reluctant readers, so it's like, oh, you hate to read? Well, this book is really stupid, so you'll have fun with this. So, you know, middle school librarians love my stuff because they're aimed at the kids who think reading is boring. So for those, it is just as many jokes as I can pack into them. They're like a Zucker Brothers movie in book form. Whereas with, you know, the adult stuff, it varies a lot. Some of them I try to be as funny as possible. I have a book called Clowns versus Spiders. And that one, obviously, I tried to make that as laugh out loud funny as I could mm -hmm. throughout the whole thing. Whereas other books, if it's more of the suspense side, I try to keep it more grounded and keep it character based or realistic. But it varies a lot from book to book. All right. And like you were saying there, like Jody mentioned, the comedy for those characters in that one book. It was the time, you know, since he was, you know, in the 50s. Okay. It, the book is supposed to be written in 2020, looking back in 1979. So there are a lot of bits where the narrator says, you know, if we had cell phones, I wouldn't have had any of these problems. <laughs> it comments on a lot of the stuff that has invalidated current horror <laughs> because technology messes up so much of the bad situations you used to be able to get people into. All right. 
Thank you. Susan. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, so I, like I said, I write contemporary romance, so I can't call on clowns or spiders or zombies or any of those things to bring humor into my books. So I kind of have to rely on um, just re regular real life. So what I tend, the humor in my books tends to come from um, complicated families. I mean, we have all been there sorting out your childhood, sorting out difficult people that you are related to. There's a lot of humor in those situations. Um, but my favorite thing to draw humor from is I tend to write in trilogies. Sometimes I get a fourth book out there um, because I find these family situations that are just so complicated. And as I'm writing one book, a secondary character kind of comes to the front and gets way more interesting than the people I'm writing about because books are hard and they're complicated and halfway through you wish you were writing anything else. Um, and so these other people kind of come along. And so I end up kind of digging deeply into families, but I also end up redeeming my villains. You know, the person who was the huge problem in book one or two by book three, I've decided that I actually kind of like that person. And yes, they're screwed up and they have lots of problems and they've done lots of problematic things, but I'm going to make up the hero of this book and having them confront what they've done and explain why they've done it and kind of wrestle with that and come to terms with that and grow their way to some place better. There is a ton of humor that you can find in there, especially kind of circling back to, I think Jody Lynn said that humor is tragedy plus time and some perspective and all of those things. So yeah, I usually end up my third book in the trilogy ends up being way funnier than the rest of them because the person that I'm, I've decided is the hero of this book is trying to be heroic, man. And they're acting against character and they're doing their best. Um, and I think I bring some special perspective to that. It's just a specifically awkward person who, you know, lives life as a first draft. And as many writers will tell you, we spend a lot of our time reviewing what we said and did over the day and mm -hmm. really wallowing in how awkward and awful it was and thinking about how you could have made it better. So, you know, there's a lot of all of that in my books. And I think that's where the humor really is rooted. You said the third one's usually the funniest. Do you try to work more humor in the first couple of books to kind of counter that or you just let it be natural? Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I wish I could say that I were that good of a writer that like I planned stuff out, but I think it was Connie Brockway who is um, another great romance writer that I love said that her career never took off the way she hoped that it would because she could never write two of the same kind of book in a row. She just got bored, right? And so this one is her light, funny romp. And this next one is like dark and serious. And a reader who loved book A picks up book B and they're like, that's not what I was expecting based on book A. Unfortunately, I recognize a lot of myself in that. So right. if you're gonna pick up one of the trilogies and read it front to back, you're just gonna get like a little smorgasbord. You're gonna get a taste of everything. All right, Not Perfect. for everybody, but it's kind of how I roll. All right, Jean Marie. Well, it depends on the story. Um, you know, I, you set out to write an urban fantasy and you're going to, even if you're like me, you cannot imagine intelligent people not making cracks at each other, especially if they have a emotional or sexual connection, because, hey, remember how I was raised. Humor is a sign of affection. It's a sign of brains. It's a sign of love. So if I've got two characters with a growing attraction, they're going to start sparking. They're going to start not insulting each other, but bantering. Um, so that is more, as Jeff says, an outgrowth of the situation that, you know, will bring in the humor. However, if I'm doing a short story for certain kinds of markets, I'm deliberately looking to make it funny. Um, zombies need brains. Whenever I'm in the anthology, I am the designated comedy writer unless Jody shows up or Esther Friesner, because otherwise everybody will be damn serious. So I go out of my way to come up with the most ridiculous uh, situations ever. Um, I Basically, there was the last one I was in for Zombies Need Brains. Um, I, uh, I knew that I was going to be in the herb bar. Okay, what was the most ridiculous setup I could think of for the herb bar? 
Well, he gets the tax due notice where he has to present the taxes in person. Hello, he can't leave the bar. But not to worry, I've got a shape-shifting dragon who's going to run into the Three Stooges in 1421 uh, Nanjing. I mean, talk about absurdity. It's just pile on the absurdity, the absurdity of the absurdity until we have this massive crash at a construction site because Three Stooges. Um, but that's, you, you plot that out differently than you do th things where you know that humor is a part of life. So therefore, if it's urban fantasy or if it's a weird Wild West thing, it's gonna come up. It's just not necessarily what you write the work around. All right, perfect. Uh, Nikki. Anything I have to say after all that, I'm like, wow, okay. Um, for me, um, give me the, the question again, because <laughs> everybody was so amazing that it was like, wow. <laughs> How humor fits into your stories? Um, two ways. Um, I've always got something to say, and usually it's a reflection of society. I grew up in a, a sci-fi kind of reader fantasy, so looking at metaphors and, and things like that in the writing or like in shows like Twilight Zone, you know, uh, outer limits. So looking at how they would reflect what was going on in the times, but did it in a metaphoric way. So there was that section. So for me right now, um, I'm writing heavy in the steampunk world, but a lot of times I found I was getting frustrated because I didn't see people of color. And it was like, okay, the outfits are brown, but where are the brown people? Like, it was just, it was really bizarre. It's like, you know, where are we in history? Um, we don't exist anymore. It's like, that doesn't make sense. So I wanted to address a steampunk world that was a little bit different than what you expect. So the civil war never happened, which meant you know, growth of, you know, this community, but at the same time, there's still some issues. But I found that that was a little too dry for my taste. It's like, I still wanted to build that world, but I was like, okay, who are the opposite type of people that would be in this world that I want to watch their story unfold? I was watching, like re-watching uh, I Love Lucy episode. We all know the chocolate one, because I'm a chocolatier, so that's what I'd get down with. <laughs> and, and I thought, what if there was a black Lucy and Ethel as a lesbian couple that solved murder mysteries in the steampunk world? That wrote itself, like that totally wrote itself. And so that's what I started to do. And it, it made it where it, like I said earlier, like uh, there were the days that were really rough. And so I would sit down with my Alex LeBeau, she was a chef. And I'd write with uh, Josephine, her you know possible lover, girlfriend. And it was like, okay, what would Lucy and Ethel do in this situation? Like, how can we make it absurd? Oh, but I still have to put a red herring in there. Oh, I still have to put a plot point in there. So it was like, okay, we're gonna put a plot point in there, but we're gonna make you laugh so hard that you don't pay attention that that was the clue that comes up at the end of the story. So I'm, I'm doing like double time and making sure that you are laughing till you cry. And then you're like, oh, okay, well, you solved the murder mystery, but I don't remember that part. It's like, no, no, I left that in there. That was during the ring toss scene. And for those of you, yeah, that one was fun. So, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, Jody. You were asked to arise from the situation. You, you, you cannot just paste it on and expect it to work. It has to be there. So uh, for, for example, I, I just sold a story that is the second in my, ready, steampunk, old west, science fiction, humorous short stories. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they all came about because a friend of mine who uh, I know from Chicago fandom, her, she goes by the name Trouble. And she came in in this astonishing corset, which, which more or less turned her into an ex. <laughs> And I said, oh my gosh, trouble in an hourglass. And she stopped and she pointed at me and said, you have to write that story. That's gonna be your title. Okay, challenge accepted. So from, from that, I, I have actually two series of short stories that are humorous science fiction, but one of them is set in the old west and one of them is set in the, in the medium far future, 200 years or so in the future. I have a 
humorous detective series, humorous science fiction detective series, in which it gives an entirely new meaning to the, the phrase witness protection program. Because I have a female detective who is forced to take a, uh, an alien that lives in a, a very salty seas on another planet. When they come to Earth, they put them into the abdomens of donors. So they're swimming around in your peritoneum. Well, she gets roped into this because uh, his previous host was murdered and he is the only witness. So it's, it's, I mean, it sounds weird from there, but I have had such fun inventing the methods of murder or the, how the crimes are committed and making them funny because humor has to arise from the situation. Okay, you have this, this cop in the future and her erstwhile partner who actually lives inside her and talks through the bracelet she wears on her wrist, which is absurd to start with. But you can't just rely on that for funny. So it has to come from someplace in the situation itself. That uh, one, of the murder, one of the murder weapons was um, high-tech contact lenses that you, know, you, can, you can check your messages on instead of an I, I, uh, iPhone watch. Uh, and someone hacked his contact lenses. So, I had a lot. I, I have so much fun coming up with these ideas for it that it evolves from the situation in which is the future, where technology is so advanced that weird things like that happen, where you can commission an entire line of clones for a TV show, and so on. Um, the uh, naturally, I, I'm known for the Myth Adventure series that Robert Ashburn began. The two of us wrote together, and I've been writing ever since he passed away. But I have my own series, which is contemporary humorous fantasy. It's about a college student who discovers there are little people living in the basement of his college library. The library he has some campaigning to have torn down and replaced with a bigger and better one instead of the sports arena that the college wants to build, therefore rendering his new friends homeless. So right from there, it could be a tragedy, but it isn't because he's so good hearted and he, he didn't mean to do it. He didn't know what he was doing and now he's trying to make it better. And as we all know from screwball comedies, the more you try to fix something, the more likely you are to make something else go wrong. And that's where you build upon the situation in a humorous, uh, a humorous novel or humorous short story is you present one facet that could be absurd and you go and you build upon it. It's like rising tension in any good story. Humorous stories are like any other story. They have to have a workable plot. They have to have believable and relatable characters. But you never go quite as dark as you can in a mainstream short story. You, you really can't because it will break the mood too much. Excuse me. So you have to know exactly how to leaven it in order to make it work. In, in, even in a, in a horror story, there have to be moments of humor because you can only build the tension so high before your audience stops paying attention. They can't take it any longer. There's a, a novel called The Keep by F. Paul Wilson, which is a horror story. Nazis have taken a lot of people prisoner in an old castle and it's haunted. And there's this monster there that is, that is gradually picking away at, at the, the Nazis and it will not end well for them. And it, it's a very tense story, but there's a moment where they have taken a rabbi prisoner and he is, he's in one of the cell, monk cells that uh, happens to be in the castle. And the creature decides to come through the wall at him. And there's a crucifix on the wall of, of the cell that he's, he's in. And when it comes through the wall, the rabbi sort of reflexively grabs for it and thrusts it at the monster who is intelligent and decides on purpose to recoil and then Lee through the wall, leaving the rabbi with a crisis of a religious context. So just there, you can throw in a humorous moment, but it has to come from the situation. So that's, that's, that's an important thing to keep in mind. And as someone who has collaborated, uh, how do you work to make sure that, I guess one person's humor doesn't overtake the other or to balance them or mesh them together? Well, with, with uh, Robert Asprin, who is the author of the Myth Adventure series, the first 12 anyway, our senses of humor dovetailed really well. We, we had the same philosophy of, of how humor worked. It was never cruel. It was not potty humor. And it never punched down. 
because that isn't humor. Punching up is humorous. You know, when, when the little boy knocks the old man's hat off with, with a snowball, that's funny. If the old man turns around and throws a snowball at the kid, it's not funny anymore. It's a big person, a person of authority picking on somebody who has no power. So we had the same idea of how funny things work and how you can make someone laugh from a sort of a human perspective. People don't really change. Their circumstances may change. Uh, we, we get more technology. We, we move to another country. We get married. We have these things. But people are still the same as they were. So the general things continue to be funny. And that's, that is something that Bob and I had in common. We, we saw that. Everybody knows a nagging mother-in-law. Everybody knows a lazy slob. Everyone knows uh, a braggart. So these these are general points that that you can you can build upon and make it funny. So that's that's how well we work together. And at the base of the Myth Adventures is a friendship that will never die. They never let each other down. They may harass each other. They may shout at each other a lot. But there's at base everything they do. Uh, is is for each other so we worked we worked really well together okay uh rick how about you uh your how humor works in your stories and then you also i know collab with uh ari car well uh it's kind of like uh, kind of like jean marie said a lot of it depends on the story itself but uh i probably have two techniques i go to more than others only because i just have a lot of fun with them and the first is that I like writing about, I like my main characters to be slightly awful people. <laughs> not evil, not like, you know, not, not just villains, just awful in a way in that I, I think it's because people in general, we all have kind of an awful side to us. I mean, we all want to read about the Supermans who always make the right choice. Uh, but I think the reality is most people are probably closer to like a Batman where like, you know, okay, yeah, I'm, this bad guy, I'm just going to beat the crap out of him with my batarang. So I kind of like, you know, I, li I like having characters who really aren't afraid to make kind of sometimes morally ambiguous uh, choices that like that the, the reader's just like, oh, no way, you're not supposed to do that. You're the hero. Um, and that's always, that's always fun. And the other thing is, uh, I, what I like to do is uh, I write a lot of horror comedy as well. So what I like to do is take situations that should be terrifying um, that are still dangerous but throw in just enough ridiculousness to them that you're really not sure if you should be uh, you know frightened or laughing um, I have this one book it's called the morning woods and the entire thing is really just kind of built really it's, it's honestly built around one joke and the main bad guy in, in it is this is this giant 10 foot tall murder murderous sas talking sasquatch and like you know this this, this He's basically just ready to crush everybody's heads and such, except the problem is his name is Turd. And because of that, nobody can take him seriously. Like, you know, even when he's just like ripping arms off, it's just kind of like, dude, you just have such a stupid name. I can't help but like, you know, but laugh during this. So it's it's just one way to like, you know, kind of take the tension of like ratching up and be like, yeah, this is really not a situation you want to be in. But at the same time, you probably can't help but like hopefully can't help but lap at it because it's just ridiculous enough to like, you know, I guess give you reason to kind of die laughing, if you will. And I mean, as far as far as working with uh, with uh, with Rachel, um, it's a lot of a lot of it is uh, I, I guess it's a combination of our, our senses of humor do mesh on some level, but they're also different on another level. So that kind of helps in that sometimes she'll see humor in a situation I don't. And sometimes I'll take like one of her heavy scenes and I'll just be like, now we're gonna have some fun with this. So playing off each other. And I think it also helps to just, you don't wanna be a dominant personality with that stuff. You don't wanna, you, if, so, if somebody is really against a joke that I'm making, then I'm gonna take it out. Um, well, sometimes my editor, my editor would argue I don't do that all the time. But I mean, with writing with a partner or so, I want to make sure that it's a harmonious thing. So I want to kind of pick the hills that I'm going to die on. I don't want to say like, you know, everything. No, no, this this is the way it is. This is this is hilarious. Because if they're saying it's not, um, there's probably there's probably a reason I should be listening to them. All right. 
Thank you. Uh, now, I'll start with you, Susan, on this one. Um, have you had issues uh, where the humor just didn't work and you had to pull it out? Yes. Um... Uh, listening to everyone's answers really makes me reflect on my own process and how humor kind of finds its way into my book. So um, when you do a lot of uh, complicated, I, well, I find that I'm really drawn to the dark things in my novels. That's what that's what really interests me, like the traumas that we have and the, the way that we process and get over and grow past the awful things that happen to all of us, right? But if you spend too much time dealing with that, it gets very dark and it gets kind of unbearable and readers really have no obligation to hang in there with you. So I think just as a natural leavening agent, humor has been my lever to get some balance back into my books. Um, and as a, a former agent once told me, that is an extremely delicate balance and I don't get it right all the time. And my first drafts rarely get it right. And so, yes, I have had the experience where I have written scenes and written whole books where I really felt like I was doing it right. And then getting someone else's perspective made me see that I had done it really wrongly. So I have had to go back and strip humor out and, and struggle draft after draft after draft to find that balance where you have exactly the right amount of humor to make the dark feel light enough to be palatable and yet you're not giving away the gravity of what you're trying to write about nor are you um i don't know giving away the brightness the humor brings to that situation so um yeah i, I have written if i'm writing a hundred thousand word book i probably write four hundred thousand words it is a really really hard thing to try to get the humor exactly right so that it's in balance and it's not overtaking what you're trying to do uh, Jean Marie, uh, have you done that and the balance? Yes. How to no. balance? <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. It, it's basically my process is a lot like Susan's. I'm going to be rewriting and rewriting and rewriting until it sounds good to my ear. And you sort of catch that, you know, after you've been writing for a while, you start catching, ah, uh, that doesn't sound right in the rewrite process. So usually by the time something's on submission, it's the balance is pretty much there. Um, so I haven't had anybody ask me, oh, take out more humor. On, but on the flip side, as somebody who loves Jennifer Cruzy, who loves uh, the fact that my husband can come up with smart remarks and, you know, without even thinking about them, sometimes he's half asleep. I look at my stuff in which and you know, after it's published or after it's gone out the door, I go, damn, I wish I could have punched that up a little bit more, you know? But um, once it got to the submission point, I've never been asked or to take out the humor or asked to put more in. Uh, it's usually there by then, but you know, on the trip to that point, yeah, there's a lot of back and forth. All right, and Nikki. Uh, for me, um, I find that humor has a, a rhythm. It has a, a beat. So different aspects of whether I'm writing a revealing scene where we're, you know, dealing with you know grief or humor, you know, in that aspect, there is a certain beat. There's a time. So you'll hear a lot of comedians, whether they're you know, writing for shows, writing for movies, or whatever, and they'll talk about yeah. You got to hit your marks. You got to, you know, there's a beat to it because when I'm writing, there is a cadence. Um, I think maybe it's partially because of my background, you know, way back in the day when rocks were soft, um, I was a gymnast and a dancer, not a very good one. Um, we didn't know I needed glasses until, ooh, mm. ooh. anyway, <laughs> but I was great on floor because that didn't move. Um, but when it came to writing humor, I noticed that my work blossomed. But I also noticed that when I read it, I read it obviously in my voice and there was a certain beat, there was a certain pattern. So it's like, when you hear me speaking or you, you read my work, you get to that certain point of like, okay, there's this buildup, but there is a beat to it. And then it's like, okay, there it is. 
and then we come back um, to you know kind of being grounded. And so that was one of the things that I noticed when it comes to uh, figuring out if the humor is the right thing for myself in in my personal life. There's a there's a wonderful meme where it says you know like when you know a woman is looking at two guys that she finds attractive you know and she's like really confident with herself and it's like yeah whatever i know you guys are into me and then it's like oh when that woman finds another woman that she's really attracted to and then it becomes like oh my god i don't know what to do with my face and <laughs> there was that level like i can relate to i am not smooth i don't have it together and so when i wrote uh, my two one of my two favorite characters um there was that, you know, and, and Susan knows this, that there's that point in your story where you're getting to the romance, you're getting to the like, when are they gonna kiss? You know, you keep having these moments that they miss. And I was like, okay, well, I really want them to have this moment where you're like, will they, won't they? But I thought, what would be the most awkward where you're pressed together in an armoire? Okay, well, that's kind of like, all right, we're, we're possibly gonna kiss. But what happens if you're hiding from people that don't know that you're in there? And then on top of it, it's a potential sex scene, but it's not your sex scene, but there's a bordello. So it's like, how do we make this as awkward and uncomfortable and hilarious? And it became, while they're trying not to kiss each other, while they're trying not to listen to like all of this ridiculousness on the outside of that door, they're trying not to get caught, trying not to kiss, trying not to get into that moment. And there is that rhythm there. And so, you know, when I was able to do that, there was that, lack of a better word, an explosion. Um, <laughs> and it was fun to write, but it was also one of those things where I learned in my own work, um, how I write, because a lot of times people would talk about, oh, you know, what's your voice? And I'm, I now have this point where you can read my work and you know, it's me, you know, it's not anyone else. It's one of those things where before I was trying to write like everybody else, like many, many, many years ago, decades ago, and when I decided to just write humor, like Jeff had said, like, oh my God, people get paid for this. Like you can actually write humor and it's okay. It was, it, it just became like, you can't tell me what to do. I'm gonna write funny. So it was one of those things that I think it was Richard Pryor that said, you know, if you have to like deliver bad news or say something that like somebody doesn't like, if you say it with humor, they're less likely to punch you in the face. So I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to talk about the ills of society, but I'm going to make you laugh. So you're less likely to punch me in the face. So, yeah. Uh, Jody. I quite agree. Uh, it, it <laughs> it, oh, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. Humor makes it possible to uh, deliver bad news or something that's difficult or, or a, social, a social reality instead of saying, you must, do, you must do this, you must not do that. But if you make them laugh, they'll relax and they'll listen. Uh, there was a, a famous tri trial lawyer named Melvin Belli, and he said, laughing juries never convict. So you have to keep, kind of keep that in mind. I, I, think, I think way back when the question was, uh, did you ever have a situation where humor was withdrawn or, or they told you to take it out? I had a short story. Three years ago, my, my brother died and it was, it was rough on all of us. It, it's still rough today. Um, and I just lost my dad too. So it's probably going to happen again. Uh, but I turned in a story for a humorous anthology and I got a note back from the editor saying, are you all right? <laughs> Which was incredibly kind and, and sweet and concerned. But the story has been rewritten. The story has now been accepted for a subsequent anthology. And now it's funny. But what is going on in your life will affect you. And you may not even see how bad things are until somebody else's eyes are on it, which is why you should always have a beta reader of some kind. And even if it's just tell me if this is funny or, uh, you know, as, as a friend, would you smell my breath and take a, take a look at it in, in a way to make sure that, yeah, your, your pacing is there. I've been writing long enough that I, I rewrite as I write which I do not recommend for everybody, works for me. So by the time I turn something in, the cadence is there, the buildup and the payoff is there, and the characters are there. So by the time I'm ready to turn it in, it's, it's polished in the way that I want it to be. But your perspective can be altered by your situation. <laughs> so 
I think that uh, it was a wake up call for me to, to realize that I needed more perspective than I was getting. And I think that's, that's true for anybody is, is have somebody else tell you in the kindest way possible, someone with no ax to grind, no agenda, in an honest fashion, what doesn't work for them. So I think it's more, more true for humor than anything else, but it, because humor is such a delicate thing, but I think it's true for any story you tell. All right, Rick. Um, I, I have my own personal rule of three. If I write a joke <laughs> and after I'm revising it, it's still funny after the third time, then that means I believe in it and, it's, and I want it to stay in there. Um, that said, you know, I still, I, I do know when I sometimes go too far. Um, you know, I have, uh, I have my editors, I have, I have my beta readers, and I've had a couple jokes where I've been like, okay, this is too far. I think it's funny, but I know people are going to crucify me for it. Um, and most of the time, it's passed by them with muster. I, I had this one, I know I, I, I was almost certain I was going to get horrible uh, feedback on. Um, let's just say it, it had to do with a character's name um, and it wasn't, it was, their name was not a kind word. Um, we're PG-13, so I really can't go much further than that. And uh, yeah, everybody looks like, I, I thought they were going to come back and be like, you terrible person. And said they were like, this is the funniest part of the book. So I was like, no, oh, okay. I don't know what's wrong with you people, but um, I did have one time, I was in an anthology and it was uh, not my normal editor. And it was a scene early in, in the story where the main character is trying to save this old lady from vampires and it just goes horribly wrong and she winds up sicking her her her, her little uh, her little yippy rat dog on him and it kind of goes badly for the dog and the editor got back to me and he's like you can't kill the dog and i was like and i was like all right he, he's like people will hate the character they'll think the character's a jerk and i was like all right the character is a jerk and you're supposed to hate him because of this scene because he's trying to be a hero and he has screwed it up so badly you know that it's gone this way and i was i was like it it stays and i know that's a cardinal sin in writing you you do not kill the dog and you especially do not kill the dog for a joke but i did and i still think the scene works because it's one of the it's one of those things where you're you're looking at it from his eyes. You only see th certain things. There's it's there's really little play given to the fact that this is kind of a tragedy happened. It's all kind of played for stupid slapstick. Oh crap! This entire thing went wrong. Um, but I mean, I can understand that some people would probably read this and uh, immediately label me a terrible terrible person. But some sometimes sometimes that's I, I, that's that's what happens with humor sometimes. All right. Uh, Jeff. It's very subjective. Oh, yeah. um, probably if you read my young adult books, you would think, oh, there was no editorial interference whatsoever, but that's not true. They rein me back in a few bits. Um, I have a book called A Bad Day for Voodoo, and the book is just completely insane. It's got a section where it says, hey, kids, if you don't want to read the whole book for your book report, just read this one chapter. And then it has every possible literary device in it so that you can just read one chapter and get a full book report out of it. But the book was written when the mashup craze was going on. So it was Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, Sea and Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters. So there's a, I had originally a two page spoof where the book suddenly switches to Wuthering Heights with a cow in it. And it's two pages of Wuthering Heights with occasional references to a cow. And the editor's like, maybe that that's one step too far, even in this book. It's like, all right, you let me get away with everything else. I'm not going to fight over this one. And then I had a young adult book called Stranger Things Have Happened. And I had a scene where the kids are in a really dangerous part of town and they get approached by muggers. And the scene goes really badly. And I just kept piling on thing after thing after thing, including spilling over into an entire another chapter. And so I wanted, the joke was that you just cannot believe that the scene just kept going on and on and on and on and on. And they pretty much definitively said, no, scale it back. And but, but that's the whole joke is how far it went. And now, you know, once the book came out, I'm like, okay, that was probably the right decision Concerning that the book as it is gets reviews saying the jokes go on too long because 
I'm a big Monty Python fan. So if you can have a conversation where characters are unable to communicate simple things to each other for several pages, I love it. And the editor's like, well, I'm not a Monty Python fan. So let's scale that back. So I'm a fan of, you know, as I like stretching jokes to the breaking point in my goofy young adult stuff, you know, an adult horror novel, I wouldn't do that. But for the kids, I like to squeeze it until the last drop of blood is out of a joke. And there are bits where they said, no, that's, let's rein it back. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, so Jean Marie, we've seen obviously with this panel that humor is one of the few things that kind of goes with any genre. Uh, what would you suggest to someone that wants to write humor or humorous sci-fi, horror, um, steampunk, write it. et cetera? Write it. Because let's face it, there are a lot of us who want to read it. It might be a hard sell with your editor because I do find that frequently with short story markets, you have to find the right editor but there is somebody out there who will want to read it. And, um, but by the same token, do not expect your humor to uh, hit with everyone uh, because humor is such an individual thing. Uh, for example, um, most people consider Terry Pratchett a god. And for most people, he is the ultimate you know, you look at, you read Terry Pratchett and you fall on the floor laughing off your chair. I read him and I see Twee. And, uh, you know, it, it's that kind of British humor that I never could get, you know, get past. Uh, but that's me. Obviously, my taste is not everyone else's taste. But then on the same token, Jennifer Caruzzi thinks Terry Pratchett's a god. I think she's a goddess. So write it, be aware that what you like, what you will write is not necessarily to everyone's taste, but that doesn't mean there isn't a market for it. And that doesn't mean it won't help people to laugh when they read it. All right, perfect. Uh, Nikki, what about you? Advice for an aspiring writer? Write for yourself first, and so last, <laughs> because no matter what, um, if your jokes are funny, or if you find humor in that, whether you're reading, reading through the first draft or it's the seventh, um, keep that lightness. What I found for myself that works is whatever mood that I'm in, um, I number like, because I, I outline, I have to, um, but I write scenes out of order because whatever mood I'm in, it's like, oh, I am not in a happy mood. So it's like, oh, I'm gonna write the anger scene today. Today is scene number 14. <laughs> or, you know, I'm really in a, you know, kind of a sweet romantic mood. So I'm going to write, you know, number, yeah, okay, we already know what number. Anyway, but the point being is that, you know, writing in that scene, as Jody had said, you know, having that perspective stepping back, because there were times where I try to write a humorous scene. And later on, it would get to the editor because I'd forgotten all about it. And they were pretty much like, are you okay? You know, blink once for yes, blink twice for no. Because <laughs> like, this is really intense and it's kind of bringing us down. So it's one of those things of, you know, I'll write my humorous stuff where I know, okay, I'm in, I'm in that mood. I'm in that playful mood. Um, so a lot of times people have said like, oh, you have to write everything in order. That may work. That may not. Um, see what works for you. But also, have your trusted friend, your trusted buddy read through it and break the news to you if that joke doesn't fly or it just doesn't hit that mark. Or, you know, for myself, I had been working so hard on one story for 10 years. Um, it took a long time. There was a lot of stuff going on. And I really wanted to get the opening line right. And that's all that mattered to me. It was like the rest of the book was fine, but I couldn't get that opening line right. And when I did, I was finally able to sh share that joy with somebody. And I'm like, does this hit a mark? And she was like, this is, this is absolutely, this works. And it was the opening line was, if it hadn't have been for the ice cream cone, Alex LeBeau wouldn't have found herself in jail. Whoa. And it's, yeah, it starts 
all the wrong, you know, basically <laughs> like, like Jeff was saying, and also like Rick was saying, where it's like, okay, what's the worst that could happen kind of thing. And then it just gets worse and it gets worse. And it's like hilarious how worse it gets. So yeah, no. So the advice is right from that place of wherever you're at, but also make sure to have that, that trusted friend that can hold your hand and let you know, okay, this works or you need to tweak it a little bit. So. Thank you. Uh, Jody. That was a neat little narrative hook, by the way, right there in <laughs> online. Uh, four pieces of advice. Tell a good story. If you want to write humor, you need to have a good story in there to start with. You need the basis for telling a story. You need good characters. You need a good setting. And then you can go on from there. Humor is subjective and it's situational. There are places where you can tell really, really hard jokes like a military milieu that would completely flop in another situation. And you have to keep in mind, who is your audience? Who's your market? Who are you telling the story for? Because if you're trying to go mainstream with it, you have to bear in mind that you don't want to lose your audience. Even if you think it's the greatest joke in the world, if it doesn't go with the market, then leave it out, save it for the next thing. But if you're going to write humor, commit to the joke. Just say, say, yes, I'm going to go with this person who has inherited the talent for creating whirlwinds wherever he goes. Commit to it, explore it. Ask yourself, what happens next after this person acquires this power? What happens next? And just go with it because you'll find that your subconscious is creating funnier and funnier things to, to build into it. And your audience will love it if you do. Thank you, Rick. Everybody so far has pretty much just said all the, said all the stuff I was going to say. Um, yeah, I, I would I would say um, I, I know I know one or two authors who their first couple books uh, they they toned it back and they tried to change their voice, um, and as a result, it's not nearly like, like they're hilarious in person, but like the books don't kind of convey that. So my my thing would be like, okay, don't tone it back. You know, be yourself in this story. Um, don't try to be Terry Pratchett. Don't try to be like Douglas Adams. You're not them, you're you. So focus on you, what makes you laugh. Um, but at the, same, at the same time, understand that, uh, understand that I think comedy and romance are two of the most polarizing genres you can write in because you know one person's funny is another person's train wreck. And uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan that... Uh, if you're going to write humor, you should you should have a pretty thick skin about taking it back about like you know taking it back, um, only because if you're writing humor, you're going to find a lot of people out there who think you are as funny as a train wreck. Focus though on finding those people who have your sense of humor. Uh, that's your audience. Don't try to like modify ne yourself necessarily to uh, to be what, what what other people are because if you don't understand that humor, if that is not your humor, you're probably not going to necessarily do well with it. Thank you. Jeff. Yeah, I agree with Rick's answer. I also agree with him saying that all the good answers have been taken by the time it got to me. I think I'm pretty much out of good advice. Maybe just that a bad joke is worse than no joke. So don't squeeze, write a joke just to squeeze something in there. It's better to let the scene play out relatively straight than to try to squeeze humor into something that doesn't require it. Thank you. And I'm sorry that you are the last season. <laughs> That's okay, because I'm coming at this from the romance perspective, right? So I feel like I can speak to this in a slightly different way. Um, but I agree with what everyone has said. Um, and I will add on that if, um, so advice to writers, you have to be genuine, right? You can't write something that you're like, people are gonna laugh at this. That's why it's funny. It has to be what you think is funny. Um, same as writing a romance. It can't be, I'm gonna write this because people will find it charming. You have to be vulnerable yourself as a writer. You have to expose yourself because people respond to that. They know when you're being fake. They know when you're, you're dialing it in. Um, and so they say, of course, you know, everyone's first novel is autobiographical, even if they don't mean for it to be. Um, so that's not the kind of, exposure I'm talking about. I'm saying that if you're going to write really right, um, you can't have any chill. 
you just can't, you can't be cool. You have to just lay it on the page. You have to expose yourself and be like, this is what I think is funny. This is what I think is sexy. This is what I think is charming. This is how it works for me. Because if you try to appeal to everybody, you'll appeal to nobody. You'll be so bland and vanilla. You have to be willing to get some skin in the game. <laughs> As a romance writer, I can say that. Um, you have to be willing to do that, to throw that on the page and just let people judge you. No one, not everyone is gonna think you're funny or not everyone's gonna think that's sexy or that's charming, but some people will. And the more genuine you are, that's what, um, that's what readers respond to. Thank you. Now, one last question before we uh, wrap things up and I'll start with you, Nikki. Uh, what was your favorite uh, setup and payoff in one of your stories. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, it's like picking a favorite kid, right? Yeah, um, because as Susan had said, certain parts are autobiography, you know, based. All the stupid things that my character did and got into trouble, that was me. Um, <laughs> like the opening scene of Maison Death, um, the first book, um, it opens with the whole ice cream cone in it. And it, there was a bee. And let's just say in my teenage years, we had a cross country trip in a car and there was a bee and it really <laughs> it just, yeah, that's autobiographical. Um, but one of the things that I, I used to study playwriting and I absolutely adore like murder mystery is like within the murder and like basically a story within a story. And I remember hearing actors talk and writers talk about if you have a gun, what is it, the, the knife or the gun in the act one, you oh. have to have it, in, you know, basically be used in act three. And I did that with Maison Death. At first, you know, I wrote this opening story, you know, I had the first few, few chapters and I'd mentioned this bordello and I thought, ha ha, this is funny. And it was, and it was a, a very quirky scene and it was humorous because I needed to get to point A to point B to change the scene and I left it alone. But as I'm writing the story, I'm getting to this point where there is a very important plot point that has to you know, get us to a certain place. But I was getting to that point where I just, I don't wanna write this story anymore. I wanted to go outside and play, you know, I wanna do everything else but write. And I was like, okay, if, if I make myself laugh and I stay here, we'll go with this. And I had mentioned it once about a ring toss scene. Wouldn't it be funny if at a bordello, because my bordello is of men for women and for other men. So it was like, let's go with a ring toss scene. And it just got wonderfully worse and worse. And, and I just kept adding to it. Like what's like, there's a you know, paper mache horse head. Like there's just all sorts of stuff going on. So that was, that was a scene that, even now when I think about it, I laugh until I cry. I'm one of those people that laughs at their own jokes and then like laughs too hard where they get giggly and then you can't talk to them any. <laughs> I'm that person. So when Jody was talking about the Easter paper and then I kept thinking about like Hanukkah bush because one of my Jewish friends, <laughs> like she wasn't allowed to have Christmas. So they talk about their little Hanukkah bush that they got and they put like little Christmas lights, but it was Hanukkah lights and just, Sorry, it just, <laughs> see, <laughs> sorry, I get really gay. <laughs> I'm going to put myself on mute. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jody. Oh, God, there, there are, there are too many, really, uh, to mention. Um, one that I, one that I really loved setting up was in a story that turns out to have been reprinted more than any of my other short stories. It's called Well Worth the Money, in which a uh, crew going out in, in a new kind of uh, spaceship, it's controlled by a screen and they have a ship's cat. Now, anyone who has a cat knows that they pounce at things that are on your computer screen. So they're, they're playing this, this ongoing game and they are overcome by aliens who uh, beam them with a ray that paralyzes their higher centers of, 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 the, of the brains, leaving them helplessly watching as their ship is about to be captured. Well, guess who doesn't have a higher center in his brain particularly? And the cat saves the day 
because I set that up all the way in, in advance. And I, I really enjoy doing that. I, I have cats. I love cats. People are, are well aware of, of my predilection for cats. So uh, some of my favorite setups and payoffs have been in my cat stories. I just, I just love the fact that they are, they seem to be so serious and yet they do stupid things that make us laugh. And they always shake themselves and walk away. And you can see the little thought balloon appear over their head that said, I meant to do that. I did that on purpose. I fell off that table on purpose. <laughs> so I, I think probably uh, probably a bunch of those. I, I, could, I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Rick. My favorite thing is uh, using the emotional roller coaster of stories against my readers. Um, I have a, I have a couple I've, I've had a, I think I, I can think of three scenes um, where these are heavy scenes a character like okay so one in particular a character dies surrounded by his friends and family it's kind of a it's it's an unexpected senseless death and I put I put my all into writing this like you know it, it is meant to like it is meant to evoke the tears because um, it goes on like people they're trying to save him it's not working you know his loved ones are watch uh, have watched him like you know die you turn the page and and suddenly it turns out oh his soul got sucked into something else and he's just in there going what the hell are you guys doing <laughs> you know um and i've gotten hate mail for that along the lines of like you made me cry you sob <laughs> and then i turn the page and it like completely change cha changes the tone and uh I, I like doing little like gotchas to my to my readers. Um, I've done a I've done a couple scenes along the lines of of like a character walking in, finding his like you know finding his something's horrible horribles ha happened, uh, you know. But since the story is told in first person, he's going into detail. He's like, oh my god, I can't believe this happened. Then then a paragraph later, I'm just kidding. I I, got, I walked in and nothing was happening. <laughs> you know, little little gotchas like that are just kind of are just kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Jeff. I think the only time I've done a public reading and not and made myself laugh unprofessionally was from my book Kumquat. And there's a scene early on in it where the characters work in a corporate environment and they're like, you know what? A monkey can do our job. Let's get a monkey into the office after hours and we'll make a vi live video of it at our desks doing our job. And they think it's a big funny thing. But then the monkey gets loose and starts flinging what monkeys fling. And it's a very juvenile scene, but I was not able to get through the public reading without cracking myself up. So that's the one I will use on this short notice. I, if I had more time, I'd come up with a better, wittier scene. But for right now, it's the monkey flinking, flinging poo scene. All right. Uh, Susan, what about you? Um, Your favorite setup and uh, payoff? I, one, of, one of my favorite. Uh, books that I wrote is called uh, Taste for Trouble. And the setup is essentially you have a bad boy soccer player who needs some behavior modification, right? He's just kind of gone off the rails. And um, a Martha Stewart type TV homemaking diva sort who um, whose public wedding with televised wedding was supposed to be like the crowning achievement of her domestic mavenhood um, completely goes south. Fiance runs off with her assistant. So she needs a makeover, an image makeover. And her agent happens to be the soccer player's agent and says, you need to babysit that dude, right? Pull everything together. If you can reform him, we'll get you back on the track. So these two end up, that's their meet cute, right? That's so they're, they're doing things. He's behaving badly. She's trying to rein him in. And they're on a red carpet at a premiere of something or other. And he's showing off and being his usual self. And he um, splits his pants, right? And she throws herself into the breach like you would and just claps her hand right on his butt to keep the press from taking pictures of his shorts, praying he's wearing shorts because she really doesn't know. She just throws her hands on them. Um, and as they walk the red carpet and people are taking pictures of all this and she is feeling good about her sacrifice, he starts giving her crap about wanting to feel him up, right? Like you're just taking the opportunity here and she is furious, right? But they get inside and of course she's a domestic diva so she happens to have a, a sewing kit and she says give me those pants I'll do let's just go to the bathroom I'll sew them up for you um so it, it's a small subtle evil payoff 
but she takes like an extra two or three inches out of the crotch of his pants and just gives them back to him and then spends the rest of the night like I as an author spent the rest of that whole scene just enjoying his discomfort <laughs> that he's just got to live with it he's so richly earned by screwing with the wrong domestic diva so I think that's one of those small elegant little jokes that just it's not broad it's not like hilarious but I really enjoyed watching him literally squirm for the rest of that scene because he is so uncomfortable. All right, perfect. Uh, finally, Jean Marie. Well, you know, it, somebody said it's like trying to pick your favorite kid. And uh, so it's pretty hard. Um, I've got a, um, a weird Western in world that never was, well, actually part of a universe that from my first published novel. And that has one of my favorite ever scenes because it is utter total mayhem on a bridge in the middle of nowhere with a siren who sings about strudel. And that's one of my favorite scenes ever. And I hope that the payoff at the end of that novella actually lives up to the scene. But in terms of a story that did everything it was supposed to do recently, it, I will go back to that Lord By story in um, second round, More Tales from the Urbar, where I set something up as a throwaway, the infamous spear on the wall, or in this case, a barrel on the floor that pays off on the last line. Oh. And it, I love it when that happens. <laughs> All right. I want to thank everyone for coming in and everyone for watching. Uh, we'll go around one more time and let everyone know where they can find you on the interwebs. And I'll start with you again, Jody. Uh, I am on Facebook as Jody Lynn Nye, three, uh, three L's, three, excuse me, three N's, three Y's. And I have a, a website, jodynye.net or jodylynnye.com. Uh, but it will be under construction shortly, so see me on Facebook. <laughs> All right, perfect. Rick. Oh, well, you I mean you could find me on Facebook, uh, Twitter, or uh, you know, under my name or at rickwaltier.com. But uh, since nobody really can spell that, I would just say go to Google or go to Amazon and search for uh, Bill the Vampire, Bill the or Bill of the Dead, and that'll bring you to my page. All right, thanks. Uh, Jeff. I'm jeffstrand.com, which has links to my Twitter and Facebook, Instagram, and my newsletter. All right, Susan? Same as Jeff, only susansay.com, and you can find links to all of my social media, most active on Twitter. All right, Jean Marie. JeanMarieWard.com, uh, Facebook, Jean Marie Ward. Uh, Twitter, Jean Marie Ward, only with uh, underscores between them. Uh, probably most active on Facebook, but I do uh, drop into uh, Twitter at least once a day. All right. And finally, Nikki. So Nikki.com, well, NikkiWolfalk.com. You can find all my information as far as social media. So my author side, as well as my chocolatier side. Um, I don't shut up on Facebook, but the good part is, is that you get more stories about um, the weird crap that my my son says and it's actually really <laughs> funny and you know it's not me writing it because it's really super funny um and it's just things that like come to him that are just normal um i'll write about my husband or i'll write about people are enjoying lunesta stories because there are moments that lunesta pretty much takes over and lunesta lunesta self is a little weird so uh social media you, you can find me there as well as my website all right again Thank you everyone for coming in and thank you for watching. See you guys next time. Bye.